Again, 503, and uh, my name is Greg Goodland. I'm the Public Affairs Officer for the Rio Grande National Forest, and very excited to welcome you all to the um, this new session of our Forest Specialist Series and Pollinators with uh, Wildlife Biologist Doug Clark. Can't wait to get it going. So a um, couple of things to get us started, though. Uh, we really like this to be interactive. If you've got a question and, and you think it's an appropriate time to ask it right away, go ahead and raise your hand. Kelly's going to go through some of that stuff here in a minute. but Or, or just unmute your mic and ask the question. We, we sure want to uh, encourage participation anyway. Um, pleased to be partnering with the San Juan Mountains Association on these four specialist series events. And with that, I'll introduce... Kelly Defy, who is our VIS coordinator, as you can see on her tab there. And she works out of the Del, Nate, uh, Del Norte office of the Divide Ranger Station okay. and is going to be your host today. And I'll let her give all the good housekeeping information. And if you guys need me, I'm here and watching. Take it away, Kelly. Okay. Well, Greg already introduced me, but <laughs> our forest series specialist is a once monthly thing. Um, let's see, what are some of our, oh, it's put on by the Rio Grande National Forest. It's hosted by the San Juan Mountains Association on Zoom. We've got about a 40 minute presentation or, well, we'll see how it goes with Doug and we're, you know, like he said, interact as, as you can. There's the reaction buttons. You can raise your hand or you can post a comment or a question in the chat. And we'll be monitoring that too. So, oh, before we get started, we have a door prize. And so we've got a water bottle, so San Juan Mountains Association. And in honor of our pollinators, we have a book that I cannot make my on screen unblur. It's 50 common insects of the Southwest and, and a little bookmark to go with it. So put your name in the chat and I will get that into the drawing for the, for the, um, other than that, I think that's it. We've got, we've got Doug ready to go. Doug, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi. Thanks everyone for joining the specialist series presentation here. And um, yeah, I was introduced earlier and um, I will do the presentation of the pollinators. And I think I'll just get started on that so we can um, have this going, gotta get this launched. <clears throat> so are you able to see the presentation, Kelly? Um, did I? No? Can you hear me? Not yet, Doug. All right, let me try again. Sorry, guys. Doug and Kelly are muted. Kelly, you can have to enable me. Do that uh, sharing thing again? Yeah. Okay, remind me where I found that. Share screen, there it is. Okay. Try that now. There we go. Now we're going. So are you seeing it, Kelly, now? We can see everything. Okay. Go ahead and put it in present mode. All right. Well, thank you for joining everybody. Um, this uh, slideshow is really just about um, all the pollinators that exist on this planet that we exist with. Um, and so I thought I'd start off large scale first, just kind of show um, 
basically space, how we float in it and we are part of it and it's very large. And then we're gonna zero in down on to uh, the planet that we are on and how we interact with all the other living organisms. Um, and thus the pollination is, is really uh, key to our existence. Um, so coming down out of outer space, coming down to our planet, um, obviously this uh, photo is just um, high altitude, not all that much in plants and material relative to say the Amazon rainforest, but it's definitely significant to many creatures that in this image that we can't see, but are important. Um, for example, the uh, Unca Padre flutillary is near some of this habitat um, and exists on very specialized types of plants that can live at these high altitudes, such as the snow willow, which I'll get into later in this presentation. Um, and then just- um, Hey Doug, excuse me. Yeah. Hey, you, you might wanna just go ahead and uh, start the slideshow. Oh gosh, I thought I did. So sorry about that. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. Yeah, that huh. way we get the whole screen. I don't even know what I'm... Your upper left corner from current slide is what you want to click that button. That's it. Then thank there you. you. Yeah. There you go. Thank you, Greg. You're welcome. Thank you. That's going to make it a better presentation. Um, so yeah, I'll just, uh, since I already started all that, we'll just move to um, this part, which was this high mountain lake in the San Juan Mountains here. And I'll uh, move on through to this section here, just showing the, the variety of plants that are very important um, and have developed themselves to be interactive to the living organisms besides plants, such as animals. Um, and that would in be, include the insects and birds and mice and bats, and also even the non-living organisms such as the wind and you know forces that are not living. But these particular plants have definitely um, developed themselves to be interactive with the living organisms on this planet. And then now just to uh, show the actual interaction between the plant and a pollinator as this butterfly. And then just to kind of back out a little bit again, just the just real basic concepts of types of pollination. Um, you have the self-pollination, which the plant is can actually pollinate itself and continue the future uh, of itself as is this diagram. It, it, can, um, it doesn't need to have a different individual plant to be successful in pollination. But then there's this cross-pollination, which uh, can, as you can see, it can, the you know, self-pollination in this diagram shows the, the plant being able to self-pollinate. And then there's the cross-pollination concept where um, you have the two different types of plants. I mean, the same spe species, but different plants that do cross-pollination. For example, this pinyon pine tree, there's the male and female um, trees of the same species, but they um, cross-pollinate, but obviously in this image, it's being driven by wind and not necessarily by insects or other forms of uh, pollination techniques, but um, just wanted to show the basic concepts of pollination. And then just to kind of back out again on the, the time of space, um, you know, currently right now, it's the known universe is at around 13.8 billion years. And, um, you know, this planet's like 4.5 billion years. And then like the first part of 
evidence of life about 3.5 billion years ago. And then it comes down to like the first forms of conifers, which would be kind of like these uh, living organisms that are out of the water and able to pollinate being driven by wind, for example, one of the most um, basic forms of pollination for that type of plant. And then the flowering plants are the ones that then started to um, get into managing or adapting or coal evolutionary with the um, other forms of pollination, specifically by the animals like insects. And um, just wanted to show you the time scale and how it's really just recently that things like this are happening. And then just another time scale, like the insects um, right now with the current information, some of the fossils that have been found have placed them around 400 million years ago, not 4 billion, but 400 million. So very, again, a very small time scale compared to the other time scales. Um, but that is the, as you can see, these associations between the plants and um, the pollinators such as insects. And also then, then the mammals started coming around, you know, mammalian forms around 190 million years ago. And of course the relationship there is you know, pollination and feeding, the plants are feeding the mammals. But um, then, you know, the flowering plants became even a little bit more prominent around 120 million years ago. And that was um, the point where the complexities of the flowers uh, or the plants themselves became a lot more interactive with, for example, insects again. Insects are definitely very significant, but not the only ones. And then I just show you the, the bats came around 59 million years ago and then, but the nectar feeding bats were around 20 million years ago. So you can see that some of these pollinators that we live with currently at this time are relatively new types of um, forms of living organisms that are now interacting with plants that um, didn't really interact back you know, say 190 million years ago. Bats didn't really come around until 60 million years ago. And then the pollination part of the bats came around 20 million years ago. And then the hummingbirds are relatively new arrivals. Um, definitely a co-evolutionary um, significant factor between the plants and the hummingbirds. A lot of those um, plants have become very designed with long tuber flowers so that the bills of the hummingbirds have the, that specificity that's very dialed into the plants. So to kind of continue on, just now I'm a little bit more of a slideshow of imagery. You know, like I had presented earlier here that not all the pollinators are insects. And um, obviously, these two images have shown one of an insect and one of a bat, and um, they are both very important to those plants um, that are part of this image is here. And just to continue on the complexity or the variety of pollinators, um, just the diversity that's out there, a lot of people wouldn't even think that mosquitoes are pollinators. Um, but they are the mosquitoes. Um, if they're not, you know, the, they bite and feed on your blood or the mammals' bloods in order to have, um, you know, to develop their eggs, to get the protein base, to be able to manufacture a quality set of and help in the process of fertilizing and then laying the eggs in the water. But before all that, the adult mosquitoes, while they hatch out of their larva and uh, their pupa form out of the water and then go into adult form and flying around, they may exist for several days um, or even a couple of weeks before they feed on blood. 
um, especially the males don't feed on blood, but they still need to have a food source to exist in those forms, those adult forms. And so they go to flowers to feed on the nectar as a energy source. And in doing that, they're actually pollinating. Um, so mosquitoes are very significant pollinators, specifically in the Arctic region of the planet. And then the, you know, like when I say insects, most people are also thinking of honeybees as being the pollinators, but they're in kind of an insignificant level of the pollinators. Um, the diversity of pollinators out there are so significant and very vital to all the different kinds of plants out there. And many of the plants are highly evolved to be specifically pollinated by a very specific type of creature. And for example, the yucca moth up there in the upper right corner, it's, it requires that moth in order to um, continue um, the seed production and have that successful pollination. Um, and then now if to the, um, there down in the lower left, that hummingbird moth or sphinx moth is another insect, but again, not a honeybee, um, but definitely a pollinator and important for many different kinds of plants. And just to show you, you know, just another pollinator besides a honeybee, it's a, it's, you know, a butterfly, um, definitely collecting nectar for its energy sources. And in doing so, it's um, picking up the pollen through the static electricity that's created during flight um, from one flower to the other. The bodies of those insects often can get statically charged and that helps um, pull the pollen onto their body. And then when they land on the next flower, it can discharge or release some of those pollens on the flowers and that's that cross-pollination process. Um, just wanted to kind of stop and show you here to see, um, is this pollinator on the left a bee or a fly? And I just want to see if anybody wants to um, comment on that. Or even send in a chat. Okay, very good. Well, you would think it's a bee, but it's a fly. Um, it's if you look at the eyes, they're very large, um, compound eyes. And if you look at the antenna, at the very front of the eyes are the are the antenna, and you can see that they're club shaped. I'll, as I go through these slides, you'll see some differences. Um, and then obviously off on this other image is this beetle that is also another pollinator type. Um, it's out there on this monument plant and it can be both chewing on the leaves, the petals, and also collecting and eating parts of those stamens and um, pestles. But in doing that, their bodies are collecting the pollen. And then when it moves or flies to the next flower, it helps do the cross pollination. Now, I wanted to show you again, I was asking you guys about this creature if it was a bee or fly. It's a fly, and it's the orange legged drone fly. And I want to show you um, kind of more information on this orange-legged drone fly, which is on this platform, nonprofit organization that anybody can join it's called iNaturalist. And it basically is anything that's living can be um, contributed um, as a citizen science kind of effort across the planet. Um, as you can see on that orange legged drone fly, there's this data sources and stuff. It's really kind of, this is where you can really start to geek out on things. 
Um, these are the locations that people have taken photographs of this specific species of fly. And, and so you can see that it's a North American fly at the, you know, um, but then if you want to actually drill in more, you can look at all these other tabs. And what's, when I was looking at this, what was really cool about this um, fly, it's um, a rat tailed, it's, as you can see right there, it's called a rat tailed type of larva. What that is, is they're an aquatic larva. Um, you know, flies have a complete metamorphosis. They go through an egg, then a larva, and then a pupa, and then this adult form. But in the larval form, um, I don't know if there's any particular image here, but they are called rat-tailed type larva because they're larva, aquatic larva with these really long tails. They're basically snorkels to be able to breathe, get uh, quality air to their bodies because they live in low quality or low oxygen type of aquatic habitats. Often the rat-tailed larva of these flies live in manure or like, you know, kind of water that you definitely don't want to drink. Um, maybe some other creature would, but not us. And um, so they definitely, <clears throat> what's cool is that image of that photo gives me more inner interconnections of what's going on, like ec ecologically um, in the landscape. So the fact that I took this photo of this drone fly. When I took the photo, I didn't really know what it was. I knew it was a fly, but I didn't know that it was this orange-legged drone fly. And I didn't know that it was a rat-tailed type of larva. But now that I do know that by taking the time to gain information, then I can see the associations of the aquatic habitats nearby. And the, some of them might be low oxygen levels of water um, in the low levels of oxygen in the water and thus this fly can exist at this at, at these ecological interfaces. So there's this always really cool interconnections. Um, I guess I'll ask you again, is this a bee or a fly? Yeah, it's a fly. So as you can see, the antennas are clubbed and the eyes are very large. This is not a fly. I, I have it definitely labeled, but you can see that the antenna are not clubbed. They're actually relatively long and that's a big key. And the eyes are not very large or con very large compound eyes like the previous two flies that I showed you. This, this uh, bumblebee here is the Western bumblebee and it's um, a species of conservation concern for the Rio Grande National Forest. This species of bumblebee has seen about us, I think I've read around an 80% decline since like the 1980s. Um, a lot of it driven by well, I, 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 it'd take me too long to talk about a lot of this, but um, just uh, that's a lot of it driven by, I, I hate them. It's the, there's these queen rearing uh, facilities that we as humans raise these bumblebees in order to um, go to these hot houses and um, release these bees in, um, tomato hothouses. And the tomato plant um, gets a very successful pollination rate when you use bumblebees because of the vibrations that the bumblebees create during their pollination. And so the hot houses that are making, trying to make a living on tomatoes use bumblebees. Well, um, there's been exchange and interchange of bumblebees across the um, planet. You know, United States or North America sending our queen bees to Europe and then Europe sending their queen bees to North America. And in doing so, 
the, there's a bacterium that lives in the gut of these bees and and then that's been the issue the bacterium that was living in the gut of the bumblebees in Europe have now are living in the gut of many of our native bumblebees and then that's causing collapse or major uh, stressors to many of our bumblebee species. So that's just one facet of many other facets of why a lot of our pollinators are really on a decline, but that's not the only one. I, the other one is habitat loss. Habitat losses, you know, can be driven by um, lack of moisture, higher temperatures, um, landscape changes, you know, like housing development or just complete change of the native habitat to an agricultural um, type of habitat. There's just another bumblebee that um, is pretty cool. It's just, I just thought it, as you can see, just kind of share again, the difference between a bee and a fly, the antennas you can see are long and they're not club shapes. This is how a process of identifying I wanted to throw this one in. It's not really a pollinator, but there's really not much known about it. So maybe in 20 years from now, maybe we'll have a better understanding of this one. I was gonna ask, what do you guys think it is, a spider or an insect? Mm. Yeah, it is an insect. It's uh, the snow fly and it's on snow <laughs> and it lives up in the mountains here during, well, all year, but they're easy to find in the winter time because they're dark like this and they're easy to see on the snow. Come summertime, I've never seen one in the summer, but I don't know if I can find one that easily. It's, again, I just wanted to throw another fun image in there on identifying insects and stuff. So now I wanted to kind of bring some other you know, how can we help pollinators since I kind of described some of the forces making it harder for the pollinators and foraging habitat is definitely a key element to pollinators. Um, when I talk about foraging habitat, really a really diverse uh, foraging habitat is some of the most key aspects to quality habitat or foraging habitat for many of our pollinators. Um, monocultural landscapes might benefit one species of insect, but most of the other insects will not benefit from it. Um, you can see that, that one photo in the lower left corner, it looks like a monoculture, but it's, um, it's the Western paintbrush, it's a native flower. It's really not that much, it's probably one acre of those flowers. So, you know, it's it's a very, that plant is, when I took that photo, there was probably a hundred bumblebees and other pollinators that were absolutely enjoying the presentation that those flowers were doing. So very important um, to have a variety of types of different kinds of plants. Um, so like back to how can we help? I mean, just kind of keep those things in mind. Um, kind of want to drill in on this part here, the reproduction habitat, the specific host plants for um, pollinators. There's, there's, you know, a lot of times, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, there's this Uncompadre flutillary, which is um, endangered butterfly and only exists in the San Juan mountains on the, it's, uh, of the whole planet. It's really just exist here in the state of Colorado at 12,500 feet and higher um, and nowhere else. And the larva specifically feeds on the snow willow here in this image. And this is the definitely the uh, a tight association between um, a butterfly or a pollinator and a plant. And that's <clears throat> really important to uh, for this species. And um, I'm sure there's other pollinators involved here, but there is a, a definitely a relationship here. 
And just another one to show you about reproductive habitat and associations. This um, butterfly here, the skipper, Reese's skipper, I have got lucky. I was able to capture a photo. It just was pure luck. Um, Rating in more on this skipper butterfly. It was um, it was one of those where it's really rare and it, and it's really a flighty butterfly. And um, so it has. It's really hard. I was lucky to get a good photo of it. And it's not very common, um, but it's larval food. Uh, the young of this feed on the grasses of this blue grandma, which is in this image here. And so um, if you look at the native prairie systems in North America, it's one of our most uh, endangered ecosystems is the prairie systems. And this is one of the reasons why this skipper, this rhesus skipper is kind of struggling is because it's not as common this type of ecosystem as it was in the past. So the more we can promote native habitats like this, the better off for many pollinators. What else can you do to help pollinators? Well, you can provide shelter for them. Um, and shelter, like in this photo, is just a simple cottonwood log that I drilled a hole in with a, a drill bit, quarter inch drill bit, and the bee is now using it and it's stuffing. I don't have an image of it with a leaf in its mandibles, but it is definitely stuffing um, raspberry leaves to stack um, with moisture and food for the larva of its, and the larva will feed on those leaves, but not only on those leaves, this bee, is packing that hole with leaves and pollen so that it kind of creates a um, fermentation uh, between the moisture, the leaves, and the protein bases of the pollen, and it creates kind of a, a bread. And then the larva can actually eat that. And so um, that's, uh, that's one simple way to create, you know, habitat right there at your own house if you wanted to. Off to the far left is this bee, the common digger bee. It's in an earthen wall. It's basically in an old adobe wall. And so even a simple adobe vertical section can create habitat for bees that is all sitting there. Um, so the more you can think about the variety of types of, of habitat, the better that you will have a diversity of pollinators. And, and another one, just to show you kind of a space and time, that nest there um, is an old paper social wasp nest that was full of those um, wasps at one time. And I left it up there after they died through the winter. And then a um, couple years later, after they were no longer in that nest, but I didn't tear the nest down. This leaf cutter bee uh, in this image then decided to take advantage of that structure and that's its shelter. That's its one of its, and it's literally going into those um, old brood nest holes there and packing it full of leaves and stuff like I was described and raising young in this way. So this bee, took advantage of another habitat that was created by another bee um, that definitely created this habitat. So just keeping your mind open to all these different types of habitats. And there's more that you can do to provide shelter for pollinators. You know, you think that rodents are a pain and they can be, but even the deer mice that you know, that we fear with the hunter virus, they are actual uh, shelter providers or habitat providers for many of our pollinators because they um, create holes in the ground and those holes then create negative space that can actually be um, utilized by, for example, bumblebees. And as you know, like in a lot of the mice, they create, um, 
some really nice little warm habitats by collecting, you know, the insulation from your car hood and stuff like that, making these special little nests so that they can raise their young in. Well, let's say the deer mice actually do that and they successfully raise their young, but a year later, that same nesting material and location may not be reutilized by the deer mice, but it will definitely be seen and reutilized by the bumblebees. And that is the association between the reproductive habitats and all these other interconnections with the pollinators and rodents and just it just continues on. Um, when what else can you do like even at your own house um, if you have a house um, or a yard just you know be one of those people who don't keep nice yards you know if it's all like full of weeds and stuff just that's what the pollinators like if it's a tight Kentucky bluegrass lawn that's you're throwing insecticides on herbicides and you're making sure it's beautiful you're not really providing um, quality habitat for the pollinators um, maybe you really do want the lawn but maybe you can reduce it you know have a really small footprint of that lawn and then have the rest of your place be more wild um, so even like raking up your leaves and then throwing that to the city dump maybe you know learn how to compost or how to like accept you know piles of brush here and there um, is important because the a lot of the pollinators use that material to nest in. Um, the other thing to think about, which is pretty cool, is bare soil, even exposed bare ground is um, habitat for pollinators. And so just, again, the diversity and variety of types of structures out there is really important to pollinators. And then what else can you do to help pollinators? Well, like we use chemicals because it makes life life easier for us. That's what we think. It, it at times it can, but the you know often um, it's uh, a problem because pesticides, insecticides, and herbicides uh, are not a benefit for all of the living organisms. And then me showing you all these interconnections. This is all interconnected. So if you spray an herbicide and you're like, well, I'm only killing plants, I'm not killing insects, so therefore I'm not killing pollinators. Well, you've killed a plant that actually might be providing food as such. As you can see, this caterpillar here is eating an aster type of plant that often I see sprayed as a weed or people think it's a weed, but this caterpillar is enjoying this weed. Um, so it's important to, again, think of the diversity and, and also the, I guess, the interconnection that we have with this planet. This, this um, is a native, this is not a native to North America. This is a alfalfa leaf cutting bee on a not native, oh, well, I don't know. I, I don't think it was. Um, this is in my yard. Um, so you don't always have to have you know, native plants to enjoy pollinators. They're here, you can have, but as long as I think you try to have most of all your plants or your yard as in the direction of native landscape or native types of plants, you're gonna really be helping out the pollinators. Um, this, I don't know the name of this, um, be here, this, but this is a bee, and it's on. It's gonna pollinate basically a rabbit brush, and then I just wanted to show another butterfly photo because they're pretty cool. Um, and then we have um, white veined Arctic um, butterfly, which is one of our another species of conservation concern, and then one of our other. Um, ones that we have to keep an eye on, look for is the silver spot butterfly. 
and it's awful. Um, Brit, that one is tied to like wetlands, some really nice wetland complexes. Uh, I wanted to show on our forest, I have not, and people have not found the white veined Arctic butterfly yet, but I have been looking. I've found um, some of these other like Arctic types of um, butterflies. As you can see, it's the Onius genus, but it's the species are different. You know, this is the Eurus Arctic and the Isaacs Arctic butterfly. And this one's the, another Onius uh, genus, but it's the Melissa one. Anyways, I just wanted to share that part. And then I know we we'll run out of time, but the citizen <laughs> science platforms are um, definitely really a positive thing to get involved with. Um, and I think at the beginning of this presentation in the chat, I, we shared a lot of those links that you guys could get into. And I, I think I'll um, kind of like slow down. I know there's a lot of information and I'll let people go ahead and ask questions now. Are there any questions? Can I ask a question? How can I ask? A yeah, I hear you. I can hear you. Go ahead. Like it might be good to quit sharing your screen at this point. So okay. Allow folks to see you in. Good idea. All right. I'm going to do that. I'm trying to get there. Can you see me, guys? <laughs> I can see you. Okay. Any nope. questions? Forty-five minutes to talk. I I can hear you, iPhone. I don't know who's on the iPhone, but <laughs> I can hear you wanting to ask a question, and I'm allowing you to try chime in if you want. I know I presented a whole bunch of uh, information. And it was probably overwhelming, um, but I I know that there should be some questions because it is a lot of information. And if not, I appreciate everybody coming in on the presentation and um, enjoying our pollinators that we live with. Oh, so okay. I see a question. Um, after pollinators winter. after winter? Well, like I'm just starting to see some bumblebees starting to come out right now, um, just barely. Um, so there's that answer here. It depends on where you live, obviously, yeah, both in elevation and in latitude. Um, you know, in the Arctic, it's still snow covered. But like if you're down in southern Texas or whatever, it's um, they're out year round. So it kind of depends on where you live. Um, anyways, good question. How can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you can ask a question. What specifically would be beneficial for Crestone, Colorado? Well, um, you know, just like I was showing in my presentation, promote, I would say native, natural, plant, ecological components. Um, 
is some of the best things to do. So uh, in Crestone, you know, um, it may cost you a lot of money to use water. And the more water you use, the more money you spend. The less water you use, the more native habitat you're going to have. And then that would benefit a lot of the native, um, you know, native pollinators and native plant communities. Um, so, uh, you know, just that's my perception. And it's try to um, really look at your native ecological components that you live in there in Crestone and understand those plants and their needs. And then look at where you live and try to mimic where you live to what is similar. So if you live in a riparian system, a riparian system is like a river or a creek, um, then you can, you know, look at the components, plant communities of the creeks. But if you live in like the um, uplands, the open grasslands, well, look at the grasslands that you live in and look at many of the plant native plant communities that you have in the grasslands. If you live in the pinyon pine trees, you know, look at what exists in the pinyon pine trees and just promote those kinds of plants or those community, plant communities where you live. That's what I would suggest. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Doug, um, oh, I could come on camera here. Um, I, I feel like, um, you know, we we have this um, feeling that the, the pollinators are in, you know, almost grave, grave danger due to all the settlement. You know, you mentioned that increasing or, or decreasing some of their habitat with our communities, et cetera. Is it, am I wrong to think that that's, I, I kind of a little um, dramatic, if you will, or am I really not getting the message and, and we really are, are in trouble with um, ensuring pollinator habitat and their survival? Uh, out of the question. <laughs> well, it's a good question. I, I know, I mean, I, I really, I really do think, I mean, there was a report that was published, I think, last year. It said the insect insects across the planet are on about a 40% decline um, since the 1970s. Um, that's significant. Um, then, you know, I don't know the reasons why, but I'm sure if you add up all the reasons, then that is why the cumulative impacts that 8 billion people have on this planet and our activities that we're all involved with in our existence is um, just as I, I showed in the presentation, the chemical usages and the changes in the habitats that we cause and stuff. Um, and, you know, part of that is probably climate change related too, because, um, you know, but I, you know, so the pollinators are definitely struggling. And well, I kind of picked on honeybees. I'm a beekeeper myself um, with honeybees, but they're, a two, they're definitely are an indicator of like we have issues. And they're often in our minds because we have that association with the, the crops that we eat, the honey that we eat, the wax that we use and and we make money off of honeybees, but we really don't talk about the connection that the native pollinators do to our food crops, as in they are the most significant pollinators and producers and contribute the most to our production of our foods than the honeybee itself. The honeybee can only do around 14%, I read recently, um, when it comes to the relative um, position of importance. That means the other, all those other percentages are related to the native pollinators. And so 
when you look at like our agricultural practices in the 1950s, we had a lot of wasteland, quote, wasteland. We had a lot of land that was underutilized, um, not mowed, not sprayed, um, you know, well, you know, not utilized, and but the full of weeds and diversity of plants. Today, when you look at our agricultural practices, it's highly refined, highly mechanized, highly precise. I mean, it's precise to the edge, you know, every square inch counts in production. Thus, you're down to one plant maybe, um, and then you're those um, back 40s or those little corners or those sections of agricultural land that was not productive in the 50s is now productive agriculturally, but because of that um, lack of plant diversity is really drop the numbers of the native pollinators. And, and so it's um, the more, and there are lots of research papers out there showing how important the diversity or feral ground near our agricultural uh, crops is so important to uh, actual food production for the homo sapiens. Wow. Well, I so let me let me ask you. You brought up bees and beekeeping. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I'll defer to any other questions that are there. If not, I'll I'll just keep going. But um, you know, say we find a a place where we have some sort of a unidentified bee that's living in an area that you know is is rather unwelcome to us in our residential areas. Um, what's the best course of action? I, give me a minute answer there. <laughs> well. I mean, a common one that people experience in towns and stuff are those social paper wasps that I showed earlier. Um, you know, yellow jackets or hornets that people call them too. Um, and yeah, if you're allergic to them and you might die from their um, being stung, it's probably best to have not you, if you're highly allergic to it, have a professional come in and get rid of them. And that's a chemical treatment, um, but not always you can, you can do, um, you know, you can capture those during the night when they're all tight in there and you can bag it and then haul it out, but you're still killing them, but you're not using chemicals, um, which is the, uh, you know, install instead of always using chemicals. So, you know, you can actually do physical activity, but you have to be creative in your techniques because obviously you could get stung pretty aggressively if you're not careful with your mechanisms of removing the yellow jackets at the doorstep of your house. Well, fair enough. I appreciate that. I guess I'll, uh, oh, here comes another question. That's a good question. Um, no. The, I'd say the beetles, what the, they are not pollinators. They are definitely, the larvae eat the, the living tissue between the bark and the part of the wood of the spruce tree. And then the adult beetle then flies to the next tree and drills a hole and then lays eggs. And that's really the cycle. They're not really out to go find protein sources, because most of their energy has been gathered and manifested in their larval form in the tree. But what they do create is a dead tree, and that dead tree falls down, and then those will provide habitat to many of these pollinators 